Cecile, Charlie, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for bringing that music. Um, you know, I would just ask you, you pray, pray for us as a church, you know, our worship commission. We're really praying about our, the life of our, of our church and our community. I want you to know we're praying very sincerely about that and our future, our direction. And, um, and my passion is really to have vital, vibrant worship in, in the sanctuary and the leadership of that worship in the sanctuary. And so we're praying that God will move us more and more towards that. We realize that during the pandemic, there's been a lot of shifts and changes. Some of you, many of you are online, and we're grateful that you can join us online. Some of you can only join us online, but we are also praying for a more vital and spirit-filled worship experience right here in the sanctuary. We feel that's very important, and I say that right from the heart. So please join me in praying about that and for that. Um, we love you, and uh, we want to be in the Lord's presence in worship together. Lord, we thank you for joining us in this place. We thank you for meeting us in this place of worship. Here we are. Um, this is what we got. We're imperfect. We're flawed. We need your power. We need your strength. We need your encouragement. And today, Lord, once again, we need your word. So speak to us again, because I know as we enter this week there's a lot on our minds, a lot that we're thinking about. Some of us are carrying some heavy burdens. And yes, some of us, Lord, are, are carrying uh, weight of, the weight of regret. So we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us afresh today. Give us a fresh word from your scriptures. And Lord, stand us up on our feet in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so I'm continuing a series that's called Summer Baggage. And if you're here for the first time, well, we're talking about the emotional baggage, the emotional baggage that we tend to carry with us. Even when we're on vacation, we can't seem to get rid of it because we always have to bring ourselves with us. We've talked about fear. We've talked about worry. Today, we're talking about the if-onlys, the regrets that we carry with us. And I want us to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, where uh, our brother Paul has a few words to say, and in, in between the lines, you can read how he's dealing with this question. Brothers and sisters, he said, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to hear that again. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Those are some sweet words, but I want us to look at some others as well as we look at this whole idea of the weight of the if-onlys. Now, playing that game, playing the game of regret, can really be painful. It's a painful thing, a mental exercise that we play right within our own minds and hearts. We may look back on things that we've done or said or the choices we've made, believing that a better outcome might have taken place if we had made a different decision. And as Aslan says in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia, we never tell you what could have happened, right? What would have happened. And yet we do it all the time. What would have happened if I had done that or I had made that decision? And we may also feel disappointment over what never happened, right? Something that never happened, like regretting wasted years or opportunities as far as we can tell. So how do we leave the past behind? Or should we leave the past behind? How do we strain toward what is ahead, as Paul challenges us to do here in his letter to the Philippians? Well, I want to begin by identifying some different kinds of regret. I want to identify some different kinds of regret. And first is the regret that's caused, caused by what we might just call dumb choices that we've made, some foolish choices or some unwise decisions. Now, I want to use Peter as an example of that, but sometimes we look back and we regret choices that we've made. Maybe like we, 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 we know we picked the wrong major for our particular skills and our abilities. Maybe we chose the wrong school, we think, or a career decision, or the choices that we made in a relationship. We look back and we go, no, that was not wise, or that was dumb. 
Now, Peter is the classic of, of, uh, example of someone who made some regrettable decisions. And we, we know his story pretty well. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he, he denied that he even knew Jesus. Three times he did. He was not motivated by a desire to, to harm the Lord. He was not uh, motivated by a desire to get Jesus killed. He was really motivated by fear and probably uh, that powerful instinct of self-protection. And that caused him to e actually deny that he even knew Jesus. And then after that third time, just as Jesus predicted, he went out and he wept bitterly. He was filled with regret for what he had done or what he had not done, what he had failed to do. The Gospels tell us that after Jesus rose again from the dead, he reached out to Peter. And that's the beautiful part of the gospel story. He specifically reaches out to Peter, and he gives Peter the opportunity to reaffirm his, his love for him, for his love for Jesus, and for his, his other disciples, and his commitment to them. It's a beautiful opportunity which Jesus invites Peter into a, a moment of healing from that regret. And so I want to ask, do you look back and do you wish that you had made some different choices? We all do it. Maybe that you had taken a different path. Do you feel that you've missed some precious opportunities? One thing that Scripture reminds us is that God works all things together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And we're going we're gonna to unpack that again. It's a beautiful and powerful truth. We'll look at the implication of this later. But there's another kind of regret that I, that I want us to think about, and that is the regret that's caused by our sin. The selfish choices that we've made. And I'm not talking about, you know, uh, forgetting to rake the lawn, you know, when your mom told you to do so. But I'm talking about those things that we do that actually bring destruction to other people, to our world, and to ourselves. Those are the kinds of choices that can leave deep star scars and emotional pain. And sometimes we can feel so overwhelmed by these painful choices that they're unable uh, to experience joy. We lose our joy. We lose our sense of, of peace and freedom. And so I'm speaking to us who carry those heavy weights. Judas is an example of one who betrayed the Lord for reasons that we don't actually fully understand. He came to see that his actions actually assured Jesus' death. And when he realized that Jesus was actually now going to go to the cross, he tried to return the silver that the, the temple priests paid him off to, to portray Jesus, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it. And eventually we read that Judas went out and he took his own life. He was overwhelmed with grief, with, with regret for what he had done. So regret can lead to self-destructive habits, right? When we carry that heavy burden, regret can, can actually lead us to harm ourselves, to abuse our bodies, and it deteriorates hope. Is that God's will for us? No. God does not want, God has better things for us. And the book of Hebrews says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Jesus lived and died and rose again to show us that nothing that we've done is beyond God's redemptive power. Nothing that we've done in the past is God, beyond God's redemptive power, beyond God's healing presence. And that good news enables us to seek forgiveness from those that we've hurt and to be just as merciful to others as God has been to us. There's so much hope in the gospel. There's so much hope in, at the core of our faith for what the future can be as we accept God's grace for the past. But I want to talk about another kind of regret, and that is the regret that comes from having too many choices. The regret that comes from having too many choices. Now consider Solomon, whose wealth and power gave him what seemed like unlimited freedom. I think Solomon, in many ways, would get our culture. 
Because Solomon had so much power, power that most people today don't have, but power that he was able to choose, basically, whatever he wanted. He writes in Ecclesiastes that he tried almost everything. He says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure in all my toil. But in the end, he said, all was what? Vanity and a chasing after wind. A chasing after wind. Now today, many of us who live in the developed world, I think we can identify with Solomon. Because we have so many choices. We don't sit on golden thrones, but we have so many choices. The ordinary person today has more choices and more opportunities than in any previous generation ever to live on the earth. We have more choices than Solomon. I was reading a great blog by a guy named Joe Forrest, which I highly recommend. And one of the ways he talks about that the modern world destroys joy is the hidden curse of too many choices. The hidden curse of too many choices. And I'm, I'm speaking especially to our young people today, but I'm also speaking to us a little bit older folks who are catching up with the technology that is dominating our culture in so many ways. Imagine that you were standing in a hallway and you're, uh, it, the hallway is lined with doors. It's an infinite hallway. You're looking down that hallway, and there are doors on the right and the left, and you can't see the end of the hallway. And the hallway extends forever into infinity. And you're walking down the hallway, and you've given, been given some instructions. You're told that behind each door is a prize. And you can open as many doors as you like, but as soon as you open a door and pick a prize, that's it. The game's over. You can only choose one prize to take home. Now, the dilemma we face today is what? Making the choice. There are so many doors. We can't possibly open them all. What's to say that if we choose door 2035, the door 3025 won't be 0.005% better? We fear making a decision because there are always more doors to open. People face it in the market as they stare at five different types of peanut butter. Or on dating apps where there's always another profile to scroll by and, and look at. Or maybe you're looking at Netflix and the 3,600 movies, and you can't pick a choice, and then all of a sudden there's that little, that little sign that comes up that says, would you like us to choose something for you? You seem to be having trouble. <laughs> we struggle to choose because we live in the age of FOMO, as, as, as our young adults say, the what? The fear of missing out. The fear of missing out. But here's the problem with this thought experiment of the hallway, the infinite hallway. The hallway of choices may be infinite, but our time is not, right? Our time is not infinite. Eventually, we run out of time. We have to make a choice. That, that's what it means to be human. And the act of not choosing will eventually be our choice. Isn't that right? The beautiful thing about life is the act of choosing itself. Isn't it? The beautiful thing about life is the act of choosing itself. It's the commitment that creates the future. It's the commitment that creates the future. It's the choices that we make in the face of so many possible choices that makes our choice finally so beautiful. We can exchange the fear of missing out for the joy of missing out. The joy of choosing. Now let's listen again to Paul, someone who could have easily played the if-only game, and how he embraced the journey from regret to rejoicing. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Hey, I'm the least of all the apostles. He tells that tells us that many, many times. You think about all the people that Jesus appeared to on the day of the resurrection, 
And he says, finally he appeared to me, and he goes, and I'm the least of all the apostles. Unfit to be called an apostle, Paul says. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. I was standing right there as Stephen was being stoned to death, and I was blessing them as they did it. I'm the least of all the apostles. I persecuted the church. I breathed murder and threat against the people of God. That sounds like regret to me. (laughs) But then he goes on to say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. Wow. Paul knew that the choices he made in the past could not be undone. Couldn't undo the past. Can't go back. No time machine. Can't undo it. Can't redo it. But they could be not redone, but redeemed. And that gave him a sense of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul said. And again, I say, rejoice. How could Paul say something like that from a prison with a guy he once tried to wipe out? The joy of the Lord was his strength. He received God's grace for the past, God's power for the present. And listen again to Paul's words to the Philippians. One thing I do, I forget what's behind and I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So standing before Jesus on the road to Damascus, the risen Christ, changed Paul's life forever. Paul saw that his past was flawed. He saw the wrongs that he had done the imperfect choices that were marked by fear and selfishness and prejudice and hatred. And from the book of Acts, we know that he turned back to God in repentance and he sought the forgiveness of those whom he had hurt. And God's grace enabled him to leave the past and to refocus his heart and his attention on what was ahead, like a runner, like a runner. I remember seeing Apollo Ono, short track speed skater, amazing speed skater in the Olympics. And in one heat, he was clearly behind everyone in the pack. I mean, he was in the back. And then this amazing thing happens. These two skaters collide, and they knock out a third. And he barely misses joining them as he steps across them, literally, Looks back just for a second, but he didn't have time to look back for very long. He kept on going. He kept his eyes on the prize to everyone's amazement, and he won. Paul urges us to forget what's behind and to strain toward what is ahead to turn our attention on the power of Christ in his risen life, knowing that in Jesus all things can be redeemed. All things, both the good and the bad. For God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for hope. Hallelujah for the ability to make a fresh start. And to allow God to heal the past and give us strength to walk into the future. And so I want to ask you, do you suffer from regret today? If you're human, you probably have one or two. Do you look back and say, if only I had said or done this or that, things might be better? (laughs) And of course, you would never know the answer to that question, right? It's a question you ask yourself that you will never be able to answer. Or do you fear that making a choice will lead to regret and missed opportunities? Do you have a fear of missing out? I invite you to receive the Lord's grace and mercy for the past today. That's a serious invitation. You ought to even close your eyes right now and open your hands and say, Lord, I invite you to receive, I invite you to come and to bring your grace and mercy to make the most important 
choice right now, Lord. I want to trust in you, the one who chose me, who loves me, who called me, and who gave his life for me with no regret. Not just for this life or this world only, but for eternity and the joy that has no end. Let's continue to open our hearts to the Lord right now. Allow him to wash over our our soul right now, to bring his healing to our memories, to be reminded again that he loves us without any regret and always will as we trust in him, as we follow him in this moment of silent prayer. I want to invite you to pray with me right now this prayer of response. Risen Lord, today I choose you, the one who chose me from the foundation of the world with no regrets. For you came to earth to show me how to live, then bore on the cross all my sin and shame. You rose again from the dead that I might know I am forgiven and set free from all my sins, all my regrets, all my disappointments. In you, I now have the life that is eternal. Thank you, Jesus, for you work all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I now let go of what is behind, and I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.